from Volume 4 of the Spiritual Councils of Elder Paisios of Mount Athos on Family Life. This is his teaching on work and spiritual life. Yaranda, in the old days people used to say, better to wear out your shoes than your blankets. What did they mean? They meant, it is better to wear out your shoes by working than to stay in bed and be lazy. Work is a blessing, a gift from God. Work gives vigor to the body and refreshes the mind. If God had not given us work, man would have become moldy. Those who are diligent continue to work into their old age. If they stop working while they still have strength, they become melancholy. It's like death for them. I remember an elderly man in Konitsa, almost 90 years old, who was constantly working. In the end, he died out on the field, two hours from his home. Besides, even this bodily comfort, which some people strive for, is not a permanent situation. It is enough to forget their anxiety for that one hour, have their food, their dessert, their bath, their rest. But just as soon as these things come to an end, they seek some other form of comfort. So, they are constantly distressed because there is always something that they are wanting. They feel an emptiness, and their soul is seeking to fill it. On the other hand, the person who wearies himself from work feels a constant joy, a spiritual joy. Yerinda, if you have back problems, you just can't do any kind of work. True, but doesn't the back need exercise too? Won't work that could be like an exercise for the back help? Listen, if all someone does is eat, drink, and sleep, he will start falling apart. He'll feel sleepy all the time because his body and his mind slacken. He'll eventually get to the point where he won't be able to do anything. He gets easily worn out, even by just walking. Instead, if he just works a little and moves about, he strengthens his legs and his arms. You see, those who love work don't sleep much, or from being fatigued, they might not sleep at all. They have all this strength because work has seasoned them and they've become physically strong. Work is health, particularly for a young person. I have noticed that some pampered young men become tough and hardened once they go to the army. The military does them a lot of good. Of course, in the old days this happened more. Nowadays, they're afraid to push the soldiers, because with a little pushing, they slash their veins. They suffer nervous breakdowns. I tell parents to pay someone who will take their children into work in order to promote their health as long as they are doing something they enjoy. For if a young man who suffers from nerves and has a good mind as well does not work, he will become sluggish. And if he sees others making progress, he gets confused because of his egoism and is unable to be happy with anything. He constantly has thoughts going through his head and his mind becomes mere pap. Then the devil goes and tells him, Loser! What a good-for-nothing you are! So-and-so became a professor. The other person has his own business and is making money. You? Where will you end up? Thus he despairs. But, once he begins working, he will acquire confidence in himself, in the good sense of the word. He will come to realize that he can get things done. His mind will be occupied with his work, and he will be spared those thoughts. Thus, two good things take place. Yerinda, some parents steer their children into taking after their own profession, and they often get very pushy about it. No, they shouldn't do that. Parents mustn't pressure their children into doing what they themselves enjoy, if their children don't enjoy it as well. I once knew a young man who wanted to study theology and become a priest, but his mother wouldn't let him. Instead, she forced him to go into medicine. The young man had studied Byzantine music and chanted. He had even made his own musical instrument and found the tones on his own. He knew Byzantine music by heart. He had a gift. He wrote chants and services. As soon as he finished high school, he took the entrance exams and got accepted into the theological school. His mother had a nervous breakdown because of her grief. She would come to me and beg me, Father, pray for me to get well, and I'll let my child do whatever he wants. But when she did get well, 
She again refused to let him do what he wanted. Later, he abandoned everything, and in the end, he wasted away. This is what I say to young people who are perplexed about which branch of science to follow. See which field you like, so as to do that which comes natural to you. Now, if what you're thinking of doing doesn't come naturally to them, I try to help them to give their heart to something that comes naturally to them. In other words, I help them follow the education and training they want, so as to create a profession out of what is within their capabilities, provided they do so in harmony with God. Does someone have a calling for music? He should then become a musician or a good chanter who, through his life and his chanting, will help those who hear him, so that they will come to love the church and prayer. Does he have a calling for art? He should become a painter or iconographer and with piety make icons, which will also work miracles. Does he have a calling for a certain science? He should become dedicated to it and work with Philotimo. You will see that what affinity someone has is evident from an early age. I once met a man at the monastery of Stomio in Konitsa with his two nephews. One of them, who was about six or seven years old, sat next to us and kept asking us questions. I asked him, What do you want to be when you grow up? A lawyer, he said. We couldn't find the other one, so I asked his uncle, Where did the other one go? We don't want him to get hurt by falling off a cliff or something. As we went outside to look for him, we heard banging coming from the woodshop. We went inside, and what did we see? He was pounding a hammer into the smooth plank used for planing that was on the workbench, warping it beyond salvage. What do you want to be when you grow up? I asked him. A cabinet maker, he tells me. May you become one, I told him with a smile, adding, So you destroyed the plank. It's all right. Yerinda, why do so many people feel bored at work? Maybe it's because they don't love their job, or maybe their work has become too much of a routine. With some jobs, say at a factory where they make doors and window frames, a laborer might be doing the same thing from the time he starts his shift until the time he leaves. Place the glue. Another worker may only apply the glass to the frame, yet another applies the putty to the window frame. They constantly do the same job, one monotonous thing over and over again, and their supervisor is always over their shoulder watching them. Not for just one or two days, either. It's always the same old, same old, to the point of boredom. But it wasn't like that in the old days. Back then, a carpenter would be given four walls from the contractors and was expected to present the owner with a finished house and the key. He would have built the floors, the doors, and window frames, and would even have set the windows with putty. Afterwards, he would have built spiral staircases, turned banisters. After that, he would have painted, built the cupboards and the shelves, even the furniture. Even if he didn't do all of it himself, he knew how to do it. In a pinch, a carpenter could even put the tiles on the roof. A lot of people today are tormented because they don't love what they do for a living. They can't wait until it's time to go. However, when one has zeal for work, and when one cares about the things he makes, the more he works, the more his zeal grows. He is immersed in his work, and when it's time to leave, he asks, Where did the time go? He even forgets to eat, to rest. He forgets everything. He may not have eaten, but he is not hungry. He may not have slept, but he is not sleepy, and may even rejoice over not needing sleep. It's not that he's suffering from hunger or sleeplessness. For him his work is a feast, and he enjoys it. Yerinda, how is it that of two people who do the same work, one is spiritually benefited by what he does? while the other is spiritually harmed. It depends on how each one does the work, and what one has within him. If one works with humility and love, everything will be illumined, full of light and graceful, and he will feel inner repose. But if one has prideful thoughts, imagining that he does the work better than the others, he may have a sense of satisfaction, but it doesn't fill his heart, for his soul doesn't sense it. 
he has no inner repose. If one doesn't do his work with love, he gets tired and weary. Such a person, merely by looking at the hill he has to climb in order to finish a job, tires simply because he doesn't love that work. The one who loves his work will go up and down the hill numerous times without realizing it. One can be digging in the sun for hours and not get tired simply because he loves what he is doing. But if his heart is not in doing the work, he will keep stopping, loafing around, and complaining. Oh, it's so hot, he says, and he suffers. Yerinda, can a person be so immersed in his career or his work that he neglects his family? A person should simply like his work. He shouldn't fall in love with it. If he doesn't love his work, he will be doubly tired, bodily and mentally, such that even bodily rest will be of no benefit because he will be mentally weary. You see, it is this mental weariness which exhausts a person. When someone puts his heart into his work and is happy, he is mentally at rest and his physical tiredness disappears. I know a general in the army who still does all the work done by soldiers. He has such love for his soldiers. He is like a father to them. He experiences such joy helping them. He does his duty and really enjoys it. Once, he set out at midnight from the Evros River to go to Larissa on the feast day of St. Achilleos. He wanted to get there in time for the Divine Liturgy, even though he would have been perfectly justified in being late and only attending the special doxology that would be sung for the feast day. But he thought to himself, I must be there for the start to honor the saint. He does everything with his heart. The gratification felt by those who do their work with Philotimo is a good and wholesome gratification. It has been given by God so that his creation will not tire. This is the true rest from tiredness. Each person should develop his gift for the good, because God, in giving it in the first place, has some expectations. The mind, for example, is such a gift of power, but depending on how one uses it, can be used for good or evil. If someone who is very bright uses his mind properly, he may be able to invent things which will help people. But if he doesn't use his mind properly, he might invent, let's say, a way to rob his neighbor. Or, for example, those who create political cartoons for newspapers can present an entire event in one sketch. If this event has something to do with ecclesiastical issues, the sketch could also reveal a complete theological perspective. Since their minds take such sharp turns, if some of these political cartoonists had studied theology, they would have been able to fathom the depths of divine meanings. That is, they could have developed this nimbleness of the mind, they could have sanctified it, and they could have helped themselves and others. But instead, a lot of them do negative work, obscene if they are obscene, ridiculous if they are ridiculous. In other words, those with some exceptional ability will become either useful or destructive, whereas those who do not have some exceptional ability won't be able to do great work, but at least they also won't be able to do great harm. Yerinda, a lot of people are irritated when they come home from work. I advise men to find a church after work, go inside, light a candle, and sit quietly for 10 to 15 minutes, or to go and sit in a park and read a small section of the gospel, so as to wind down a bit and then to go to their homes, peaceful and smiling, instead of being irritated and ready to pick a fight. They shouldn't bring their problems at work home with them. They ought to leave them outside. But Yerinda, some of them are justified, for the responsibility they have at work fills them with anxiety. It fills them with anxiety because they don't involve God in their affairs. Even the sluggard who says, Oh well, God will provide, is better than they are. I prefer someone is an employee and do his work well with Philotimo, but that he simplify his life, that he restrict himself to the essentials, and that he keep his mind free from worry rather than be a factory owner who constantly whines and moans because he's usually in debt. Pride gets in the way, so he says, 
I'll take this much of a loan so that I can produce this and that in order to better arrange things for myself. Then he finds that he's miscalculated. He goes bankrupt and he has to sell everything and so forth. There are also many people who don't put their mind to work. They just get pointlessly tired without having done any work. Then they can't respond to what is expected of them, and they get anxious. For example, someone wants to learn a certain trade, but doesn't pay any attention. So he comes and goes for years on end without making any progress, because he never uses his mind. He has to figure out what he will need for his work, and then go about getting it. Look. When I worked in the world as a carpenter, I realized that I needed a lathe for the furniture I made. What should I have done? Should I have gone to find someone to do the work for me? No. I got myself a lathe and learned how to use it. Next I saw that I needed to make spiral staircases. So I sat myself down, called to mind the math and geometry I had learned, and figured out how to make them. If you don't use your mind, you end up tormenting yourself. In other words, what I want to emphasize is that one should put his mind to work, because at work one faces a whole heap of challenges. In this way, he will become a good craftsman, and from then on he will know what to do and he will be able to proceed. That's the key. The mind ought to be creative in all matters. Otherwise, man remains underdeveloped and wastes his time. Everyone should, by his life and prayers, Sanctify his work and be himself sanctified. And, if he is an employer and has responsibilities, he should also help his employees spiritually. If he has a good inner state, he sanctifies his work. For example, when young people go to study under a craftsman to learn a trade, concurrently, they ought to be helped to live spiritually. This will be of benefit not only to the craftsman, but also to his employees and customers, for God will bless his work. Every profession can be sanctified. For example, a doctor mustn't forget that what helps the most in medicine is the grace of God. This is why he should strive to become a vessel of divine grace. A doctor who is a good Christian, along with being a good scientist, helps the sick with his kindness and his faith because he encourages them to face their illness with faith. He can say to someone who suffers from a very serious illness, This is as far as medicine has progressed. From this point on, however, there is also God who works miracles. Or a teacher should try to instruct with joy and help the children in their spiritual rebirth, something which not all parents are able to do, even if they have a good disposition. While teaching them to read, he can also teach them to be good people. Otherwise, what will be the benefit of knowing how to read? Society needs good people, who will do well in whatever profession they choose. A teacher shouldn't only pay attention to whether the students know their lessons well. He should also take into consideration the other good qualities children have, such as piety, kindness, and philotimo. God's grades don't always agree with those of the teachers. The D that one child receives might be an A in God's eyes while an A for another child might be a D to God. Yerinda, when someone is having a hard time at work, what is to blame? Could it be that he doesn't approach his work with good thoughts? If he approaches it rightly, then whatever job he does will be a celebration. Yerinda, what about the person who is embarrassed because he's doing heavy or disdainful work, for example, he works in construction or washes dishes at a restaurant? How should he put things into perspective? If he thinks of Christ and how he washed the feet of his disciples, he will stop worrying. It's as if Christ was saying to us, you should do likewise. Whether one is washing dishes or digging ditches, he should rejoice. Another person may have to clean out sewers filled with germs because the poor man doesn't have any other work. Is he less of a person? Is he not an image of God? Once there was a family man who had cleaned out sewers for a living, and who had attained a great spiritual state. He suffered from tuberculosis, and although he had the chance to quit, he didn't want to because he thought, why should someone else have to suffer? He loved the scorned life 
and for this, God gave him grace. Work does not make the man. I once knew a longshoreman who had raised someone from death. When I was the Dikaios at the Skeet of Ivoron, I was visited by a man who was about 55 years of age. He came late in the afternoon, and not wanting to disturb the fathers by knocking, he slept outside. When the fathers saw him, they brought him inside and told me about him. Why didn't you ring the bell so that we could let you in and take care of you? I asked him. What are you saying, father? How could I possibly disturb the monks? He said. I noticed that his face had a certain radiance. I understood that he must live very spiritually. He told me that he was orphaned at a young age when his father died, which was why, when he later married, that he loved his father-in-law so very much. Before going home, he always stopped by his in-laws. But he was constantly worried because his father-in-law swore a lot. He had pleaded with him many times not to swear, but he only got worse. At one point, his father-in-law became seriously ill. They took him to the hospital, but after a few days, he died. The man was not with him at the hour he gave up his soul because he was unloading a ship. When he arrived at the hospital and found him in the morgue, he prayed with great pain, My God, I beg thee to resurrect him, that he may repent, and then take him. Right then, the dead man opened his eyes and moved his hands. As soon as they saw this, the personnel who were there ran away. He got his things together and took him home, perfectly well. He lived another five years in repentance and then died. The man said to me, My father, I thank God so much for doing me this favor. Who am I that God would grant me such grace? He had great simplicity and such humility that it didn't even enter his mind that he had raised someone from the dead. He was completely dissolved by gratitude to God for what had been granted to him. Many people torment themselves because they do not succeed in being glorified with vain honors or in becoming rich with empty things. They don't realize that such things are not needed in the other life, the true life, nor that they cannot be carried over. There, we can only take our good actions, which having removed us from here, this life, will grant us the necessary passport for our great and eternal journey. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, of Elder Paisios, of Manathos, and of all the saints, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us. Amen.